it's Eva Cartman, and you're listening to the Dream Big Podcast Show, the place to go to learn, laugh, and grow. Today we welcome oceanographer Dr. Kate Stafford, and she's going to play some actual recordings she captured underwater of the sounds that whales and seals make in the Arctic. This is episode 74, Big Dreamers. You ready? It's time to dream big. Welcome to the Dream Big Podcast Show. We're inspiring you to shoot for the moon, take aim and go. We bring to you amazing guests who truly love what they do. Every day they're living their dreams, and so can you. Dream big, take action to reach your goals. Are you pumped yet? It's showtime, let's rock and roll. Welcome to the Dream Big Podcast Show. I am your host, Steve Cartman. And today, I'd like to start by telling you about a special gift we have for all you big dreamers. We created a super cool Dream Big journal that we want to ship to you. And get this, the front of the journal has an illustration of an astronaut in outer space. What is so amazing is that the journal is printed and personalized with their own face and name. So you'll see your face on the cover of this journal as an astronaut. Oh, and it's free. We just ask that you help cover the cost of the shipping. Parents, please go to dreambigpodcast.com to claim your free personalized Dream Big Journal while this offer is still available. You'll see a video of my mom and I showing our journals. Go to dreambigpodcast.com to get your free journal. I want to give a quick shout out to the review of the week. This is from Jenny and reads, Love, 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 love the Dream Big Podcast. The episode with Oz Perlman recently has all of us amazed. How did he guess the city Eva was thinking of and the word Olga had picked? Unbelievable. Thank you for inspiring us all to dream big. Thank you, Jenny, for your kind review. Big dreamers, please keep the reviews coming. My family reads them all, and we are so grateful to learn how much of our audience is enjoying the show. It's time for you all to enjoy our interview with Dr. Kate Stafford. Dr. Kate has worked in marine habitats all over the world, from the tropics to the poles, and is fortunate enough to have seen and recorded blue whales in every ocean that they visit. As always, we have show notes at dreambookpodcast.com slash 74, where we will include links to Dr. Kate's website and everything we discuss in the interview. Without further ado, here's our interview with Dr. Kate Stafford. Let's roll the tape. Hi. Hello. Hello. Kate. Welcome to the Dream Book Podcast show. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. We're so excited to talk about um, your passion, oceanography. Great, me too. Dr. Stafford, uh, you're an ocean, uh, like Eva said, oceanographer, which to be honest, um, Eva told me that she didn't even know that that was a profession until we were looking for interesting people to interview and came across your TED video. Can you please share what it means to be an oceanographer? Sure. So uh, at its very basis, an oceanographer is somebody who studies the oceans. Um, and there's different kinds of oceanographers, people who study the temperature and the saltiness and the currents in the ocean. They're called physical oceanographers. People like me who study the biology, the life in the ocean, uh, I'm a biological oceanographer. And sometimes people think about uh, biological oceanography and marine biologists as kind of the same thing. But marine biologists really, um, they study marine life. And oceanography studies, biological oceanography studies how the environment, the ocean, influences the life that lives in it. That's interesting. Mm. When did you decide you wanted to be an oceanographer? You know, um, I started out when I was probably about your age wanting to be a veterinarian. So I've always really liked animals. And then I was lucky enough to do my undergraduate work, go to college at the University of California at Santa Cruz. And the campus there is right on Monterey Bay. It's 
beautiful. There were so many wonderful courses in oceanography that that really got my interest. And then I was able to take a class on animal behavior, and most of the class was spent up at an elephant seal rookery where we would actually Mm. take data and study the animals. And it never occurred to me that that could be a job, that spending all day outside getting covered with seal poop and coming home Mm. with sand in every crevice could actually be a job. And that's what really got me started. And then the idea of thinking about the ocean and the animals that live there and all the challenges of the animals that live there, that that was what really spurred me to want to become an oceanographer. Hmm. And um, it is important for all our big dreamers to know that no matter what your passion is, there's likely to be a profession that um, when you grow up, you can do, or right now you can do. Yes. You know what? That's so true. And and what I tell people who contact me, whether they're really young people like you or students, it's like you never know what skill set you have that can be applied to do something. You might be a really good boat builder or a computer programmer, and there's always a way that you can take that skill and use it to do the job that you love. Hmm. That's interesting. And um, it's also like you can make a living on something that you love deeply. And it doesn't matter if it doesn't exist. As you can see big dreamers and little big dreamers, it is possible. And keep discovering yeah. what you love. And you can combine passion and make a living because of that passion. Yeah. I can. I consider myself really, really lucky to be able to do what I love as my job. That's great. And let's talk a little bit more about the ocean because it's such an important part of our Earth. Yeah. Why is the ocean so important to the Earth? Well, the the ocean is incredibly important for a number of reasons. And probably one of the most important that I think people don't really think about is the ocean basically provides anywhere from 50 to 85% of the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere, the oxygen we breathe. So plants on land, like trees, are really important for making oxygen. But the plants that live in the ocean, called phytoplankton, um, they actually produce most of the oxygen that we need. And oceans also influence weather, right? Weather patterns worldwide are driven by ocean currents, So those are just the movements of different water masses. And additionally, if you think about it, you know, there's 7 billion people in the world right now, and almost a third of them live within 60 miles of an ocean. And so oceans provide food for people and animals. And from my work in the Arctic, the people who live there really rely on the ocean, and they say that the ocean is their garden. So the oceans are important for our air, They are important for our atmosphere. They're important for our food. Yeah, we sometimes forget how how huge the ocean. And so most of our planet is the ocean, and that's, like, really hard to imagine. And the times I've been on, like, planes, and I've flown over water, and all around me there's just ocean in all directions. And I know that you have spent a lot of time in the Arctic. Um, Can you share how you get to the Arctic? Well, you know, you can actually fly to the Arctic. It's a lot easier than getting to the Antarctic, where you've got to generally take a boat for a couple weeks. But people have lived in the Arctic for millennia. Um, And there have been uh, settlements of people in the Arctic. So there are actually airplanes. And in fact, for much of the Alaskan Arctic, because I do a lot of work in Alaska, but I also work in Greenland, the only way you can get there is either by a boat, but that's in the summer when there's no sea ice, or by a plane. Or I suppose you could take a dog sled, but that would take a really, really long time. That would be fun. That would be really fun. I've never been on one of those before. And I've heard that there's been some climate change in the Arctic. Can you please explain what climate change means? Sure. So 
maybe one of the best ways to think about it is um, I've heard that recently. So climate is like your personality and the weather, which is not the same thing as climate, is like your mood. So you could wake up in a foul mood one day, but then your mood might get better five minutes later. That's like the weather. The weather changes very quickly over a short area. The climate of a region is its typical or average weather over a long time. So if you think about your personality throughout your life, it's unlikely to change very much. So climate is the overall average patterns of weather in a region. Seattle's climate tends to be pretty rainy. Los Angeles tends to be pretty dry. But every now and then, of course, Seattle will have beautiful weather, which isn't the climate, and Los Angeles will have rain. Now, if you think about somebody's personality as being climate, and if your personality starts to change really, really quickly, that kind of changes who you are. And what's happening now on the planet is the planet is warming up. So there might be a cold snap on the East Coast where it's brutally cold, but that's just weather. It's not going to stay cold forever. Um, and right now, up in the Arctic, for instance, everything is getting really warm. There's a lot less sea ice. The sea ice is thinner. Temperatures are higher. And that's changing the migratory movements of different animals. Um, it's changing who shows up in the Arctic. And it's really completely altering the habitat of the Arctic. Wow, that can wow. be devastating. I'm sure a lot of animals uh, are not even going there anymore because of the climate change. What can we do about it, doctor? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's a harder question, right? So day to day, there are things that we can all do to decrease what we call our carbon footprint because global warming is caused by increased CO2 in the air. CO2 is the gas that we breathe out. Um, it's a gas that comes, so it's a natural gas. It normally occurs in our atmosphere. And in fact, CO2 actually helps trap some of the heat from the sun, and that's what makes our Earth habitable. But now there's so much CO2 in the atmosphere that it's trapping so much heat that overall, globally, the Earth's climate is warming. So we need to reduce our emissions of CO2. And that's really going to take a government and international movement to do this. But on a day-to-day -day basis, we can do things like turn off the lights, um, ride your bike. Maybe instead of having meat every meal, you have a plant-based diet every now and then because growing plants takes less energy and puts less carbon into the atmosphere. So, so these are small things that can be done, but could you imagine if everybody did them? We might actually yeah. make a big change. Yeah, we could. Just taking one step at a time, one little change. Yeah, and we have to prep. We have to protect our world for future generations. And I really hope some of the adults out there who are listening um, just take action. And teach their kids how to take action as well. So we, yeah, we actually can challenge our listeners. Maybe they can come up with a challenge, what they're going to do every day. We love challenges, right? We yeah. Day. What do you think we can do in our house? Turn off the lights. Yes, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. Yes, we have to we have to turn off the lights when we go to school, right? Or oh. we go to work. Yeah, and maybe good. so we we not can not um, that, much, that much electricity, like lights, and maybe things yeah. that are like connected. Yes. So we encourage our listeners to take action and then write us email, uh, eva at dreambigpodcast.com. Please let us know what you did uh, in your household to protect our um, world from warming up, our protecting climate change from getting warmer. Yeah, and um, also, um, Dr. Stafford, um, we watched your tech ted talk on the underwater sounds in the arctic ocean and you were kind enough to send over some sound files and i would love to try and play them so we can talk about the sounds and the animals that are making them 
Yeah, because uh, bring the awareness, bringing the awareness about the animals of Arctic is very important. I think if our listeners uh, will hear from like first hands, I would say um, about the sounds and know that what kind of animals exist there. Yeah. Maybe they take more action towards protecting them. What do you think? Yeah, I think so too. And big dreamers, little big dreamers. I know that some of you may think that animals underwater, you guys may be thinking, animals underwater make sounds? They do. Because they have to communicate and they use it for navigation. Right. So, um, Dr. Kate, how did you record them? We're going to play that so, one by one now, but I want to know first, how did you record them? So there were two ways that I recorded the sound files I gave you. One uh, was with what I call a dipping hydrophone, which is just an underwater microphone. So think about a microphone on a cable. And I went out onto the edge of the ice up in Alaska and put the hydrophone in the water and plugged it into my recorder, very similar to, to you recording this podcast now, and got the recording that way. The other mm. recordings come from something that I call an oceanographic mooring. So it's a bunch of instruments that we put underwater, and it sits there for a whole year, and it's got a little recorder on it, and so it listens and records for maybe 15 minutes out of every hour throughout the year underwater. Now, to get those data back, we have to get all the instruments back, too. So I only get to rec- listen to those sounds when I get them back. Mm, that's interesting. So let's listen. Let's play the first yeah. one, and then we'll talk about it. think about that sound that was like what kind of animal was that sound from because it sounded like this it just sounded like uh, it's hard to explain it sounded it. like a wind to me <laughs> like like <laughs> wind <laughs> who was that well that was an animal called a bearded seal. And and oftentimes people will say, it sounds like aliens. (laughs) And bearded seal, the males make these trills that you heard, the woo, during the spring. And I have to say, sometimes when you put your hydrophone, your underwater microphone down, all you hear are bearded seals. They never stop talking (laughs) in the spring. (laughs) What are they communicating about? Well, so because it's just made by male seals, we think what they're doing is either um, sort of letting the female seals know that, that they're around and and want to date, or maybe they're telling other male seals, hey, this is my territory and I'm a bigger, badder seal than you, so back off. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't really know yet. Okay, let's play second one. Wow. Who was that? So that was actually two different kinds of animals making sounds at the same time. The low frequency was a bowhead whale. Mm -hmm. And the high frequency whistling, those were beluga whales. And, Mm -hmm. And that sound clip is a really good example of how crazy it sounds underwater in the Arctic in the spring. Everybody's making noise at the same time. Wow. 
That's very interesting. Very, very interesting. So, um, and do you study about whales a lot, doctor? Yeah, I would say most of my research has been the study of whales using the sounds they make. Because one of the really cool things about whales and dolphins is that different species, so killer whales or sperm whales or blue whales, they all make different sounds. So you can tell a blue whale from a killer whale, from a beluga whale, from a bowhead whale. So by using our hydrophones, we don't have to, to be in the field all the time. We can listen or eavesdrop on the ocean for 24 hours a day all year round and determine what species are where and when. Hmm, that's very interesting. And I was wondering, what do you find so fascinating about the whales? Oh, so many, many things. Um, so, so let me start by saying that, that I don't necessarily find whales any more fascinating than bees or frogs or bats. I mean, those are amazing animals who have these great behaviors that, that we're really just beginning to understand. Um, in fact, I would love to go off and study elephants. But, mm -hmm. but for me personally, um, the adaptations that whales have, the adaptations that have evolved to let them live underwater are pretty fascinating. If you think about it, and, and Eva, you said this earlier in terms of using sound to navigate or find prey, everything they do is underwater and almost everything they do is tied to sound because light doesn't go very far in the ocean and, and chemical scents or odors don't travel very far. So they really need to use sound. And what's really cool is trying to understand how they do it. Like how, how does a blue whale migrate thousands of kilometers or find a patch of prey only using sound? And that's what really fascinates me is by being able to eavesdrop underwater, you get this picture of what's going on, but you have really no idea what's actually going on. So it's this spectacular mystery. That's, uh, that's so true. Even yeah. Even we um, went to see whales. Oh, yeah. We went on a whaley, whale um, watching trip a couple years ago, um, I think when I was about five years old, and we saw the whales just jumping and playing. And it's really amazing to see them up close um, like that in the wild. Right. And we actually Isn't that cool? got to swim yeah. with, um, with whales. You and yeah. Dad, got to, they got to swim with um, whale we? sharks. Whale sharks. Yes, that's true. Oh, whale that's sharks. cool. I was wondering why they have no teeth like sharks do. Well, some whales actually do have teeth, and those are uh, dolphins and killer whales and sperm whales. They all have teeth because they use their teeth to grab pieces of prey and suck them down. But baleen whales, like gray whales or humpback whales or blue whales, they're called baleen whales because they have these plates of baleen in their mouth, and it's made out of keratin, which is very similar to our fingernails. So think about all these long fingernails hanging down from the top of your mouth, and they use that to filter out their prey because, you know, the biggest animals on the planet, the large whales, eat some of the smallest animals on the planet. So mm. they might eat something that's the size of a grain of rice, and to be able to filter that out, you need basically these plates of baleen, which traps mm. the prey, wow. and then they lick them off. Interesting. And how, uh, how far can they hear? Boy, that's a really good question. Um, so some whales, like blue whales or fin whales, uh, make really low frequency sounds, sounds that are almost too low for us to hear. And sounds like that underwater can travel hundreds of miles, if not thousands of miles. And, you know, sound travels a lot further underwater than it does in air. I mean, Eva, on the, the playground, you could shout really loud and a friend of yours on the other side of the playground might be able to hear you. If you were a whale underwater and you shouted, uh, a friend of yours who lived 10 or 20 miles away might be able to hear you. So some wow. of these sounds go really far. 
And I was wondering, how do whales hear? They don't really like have ears like us sticking out of our head, out of their heads. That's such a good question, and it's actually really interesting. So, so whales, you know, they they evolved from land mammals, so they do actually have ear holes on the side of their head. But one of the super cool things about dolphins, you know, killer whales or bottlenose dolphins, is they actually hear through their lower jaw. Wow. So sound goes into their jaw and up into their ear bones. So they've got, you know, they've got an ear bone just like we do, but they get sound through their lower jaw. With the big whales, the the blue whales, the, the fin whales, we're not really sure because their lower jaw bones, they're really dense. So they don't receive sound through them, but they might receive vibration through their jaw bone. Um, but we just, we still don't know because they're so hard to study. And that's one of the really cool mysteries about these animals. Yes. As we mentioned before, ocean is so huge and we so, we know so little about the ocean and about the animals that live there way, way, way less than we know about earth and animal, uh, on earth. So maybe our little big dreamers, will get fascinated by these studies and by these facts and would like to learn more. Yeah, because they're, we know about dolphins and whales and some fish and stuff, and fish and eels and other animals, but still deep, deep down in the deepest part of the ocean or sometimes like at the shallow end of the ocean, Still, we, there are so many creatures that we haven't discovered yet. Yes. You're absolutely right. That's amazing. So uh, is there anything um, that we, we can do or kids can do about protecting the ocean? Because it's such an important part of our life. And a lot of times I feel like it's been polluted or something happens or the boats like spill oil. Yeah. Also, I watch a video online and there are these things called plastic islands because oh, yeah. can you yep. explain what that is? And how it affects so, us in life. So what, what my recommendation was going to be, in fact, was that it had all to do with plastic, right? So maybe one of the easiest thing that kids can do, even if they don't live near the ocean, is try to reduce your plastic usage. So when you get a drink somewhere, tell them you don't want a plastic straw because that's something you're going to use once and it's going to get thrown away. And a lot of that single-use plastic ends up in the ocean. And balloons, for instance, balloons are not biodegradable, not even ones that are labeled as biodegradable. So it's fine to have some at your birthday party, but don't let them go because they're going to get into the ocean and animals can choke on them and die. And we do have all these tiny little bits of plastic all over the ocean. Um, And they've even said now that in the depths of the Arctic, we're finding plastic. So if you can find a way to even once a day or once a week or a couple times a day, say no to a single-use plastic object, you know, bring a super cool water bottle instead of taking a plastic water bottle. Think about all the plastic we use, and then ask yourself, do I need that straw? Do I need this bottled water when I could just get tap water? Um, this is one way that, that I think that kids and people can really make a big difference. Yes, that's yeah. right. Thank you so much, Doctor, for reminding us about it. It is easy, and it starts from our household. Yeah, and... and the big change happens... If you just from think years. about... If, how many times you've seen people just throwing their trash out onto the street? That trash, it winds up in animals' throats and then or on their heads, like plastic bags. Um, turtles, yep. they think they're jellyfish, and they exactly eat them, and it just gets caught in their throat, and they die. Yeah, Yeah, which is super sad and preventable, right? Yeah, we could, all those people in the world, they know about it, but even the the people who try really hard to do it, there are still 
the some the the people they just see throw out on the street. And if you go on the beach and you see plastic, um, pick it up, pick it up and put it in the yeah. trash can. You know, we have trash cans all over um, our beaches in California, but still we find trash on the beach. Maybe you and your family, little big dreamers, can have a date. Uh, on the beach mm -hmm. where you do something good for the ocean, for the, uh, for the beach and, uh, maybe advise other people to also keep it clean and nice. Yeah. Don't have somebody think somebody else is going to pick it up for you. The animals, they are exactly. going to die from it. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kate, for bringing awareness about it. Um, we will be wrapping up our interview very soon. But before we let you go, uh, we would like to ask uh, what we call rapid fire questions. Right, Eva? Yeah, that is where we ask you a question quickly and you answer quickly. Perfect. First question. We would like to know <laughs> more about you and about uh, what's the daily routine of our oceanographer like, right? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any daily routines? You know, honestly, beyond making myself a big cup of coffee in the morning, I really don't. And I, I suspect I might be more efficient if I did. That's cool. That's so mm, good. Yeah. What's your proudest moment in life? Boy, you know, that one is actually, it's really hard to answer. Um, I'm not sure I could point to any one moment in my life where I've been especially proud, um, I'm always really humbled and pleased when when people have seen talks I've given or like you guys reached out because you saw my TED Talk, when it, when it means that something that I've done has maybe influenced people or made, made a difference. But, but, you know, I don't know if I've had any great moments in my life. Maybe there's some to come. <laughs> I'm sure you did. Look at look at yeah. all the education that you provided for millions of people through the TED Talk, and we're so so happy you joined our podcast with uh, with this topic, so we can yeah. together educate our listeners. What is your favorite thing to do when you're not working? Well, unfortunately, I work a lot, like maybe too much. But when I'm not working, I really love to be out hiking in the mountains or walking along the beach. And just being out in nature, because that's really, that's what I value probably most in all the world is, is our beautiful planet and all the amazing places we have on it. Mm -hmm. If you go back in time and talk to your 10-year-old self, what would be your best advice? <laughs> Honestly, um, I would tell her, be kinder to your younger sister, because she's going to be one of your best friends when you grow up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would tell myself that too. <laughs> you can tell you some of that now. You have a yeah. two and a half year old sister. But you're pretty kind. She loves you. you yeah, love but her. she annoys me a lot. <laughs> That's what happens See? when you have a sister. <laughs> when you have exactly. doubted yourself in the past, what made you overcome those fears? Um, you know, I think having really good mentors. So people who I could talk to and who told me, you know what? You can do this. Um, and then when you have people who tell you that, even if you doubt yourself, then suddenly, you know, even though you're scared to do something, you just try to do it anyway. And, and then you succeed. Or sometimes, as I've certainly experienced, you fail miserably. But if you learn from your failures, then that makes you a better scientist and a stronger person. But, but I think really being persistent and realizing that, that failure and doubt are part of everybody's life, but, but you've got to sometimes just tell that little voice back there to be quiet. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. And you have already made many of your dreams a reality, but if you look at yourself today, what's your big dream for the future? So one of my big dreams is for the planet. Like, I would love for us to work to reduce global warming and and save the Arctic because it's a place that I love so much. But but personally, if I could do anything in the world, I would want to get in a submersible and go under the ice in a place called Fram Strait, which is between Greenland and a place called Svalbard. 
and study the bowhead whales that sing there year-round under the ice. Hmm. Hmm. That's so cool. Never heard that dream before. Yeah. That's very, very unique. Well, it's pretty unique, yeah. Yes, thank you, Dr. Steffer, so much for joining us on the podcast. Uh, and I'm sure our big dreamers and little dreamers, they enjoyed our show as much as we did. We will include all the links to the sounds, to your website, and to the TED Talk and our show notes on our, podca- on our website, dreambigpodcast.com, on our blog. And um, uh, by wrapping up our interview, maybe you can remind our listeners where can they find more about you? Um, well, I've got a website at the University of Washington, which is kind of boring, but it's at apl.uw.edu and look for Kate Stafford. Um, but there's also my TED Talk. And then for your listeners who subscribe maybe to Highlights magazine, uh, there was an article on some of the work I do out about this time last year on bowhead whales. That's awesome. Hmm. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Well, we Thank you guys. Thank you. We encourage our big dreamers and little dreamers to take action to protect our environment, to protect our ocean. As we mentioned, you can have a challenge for your family where you go to the beach and you pick up trash from the beach or you reduce plastic in your household. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having me. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye. Wow. That was such a fascinating episode. I especially love when Dr. Kate played the actual recording she had captured so we can all hear the magical underwater sounds of the Arctic. Be sure to check out our show notes at dreambigpodcast.com slash 74 for links to Dr. Kate Stafford's website and everything else we discuss in the episode. When you go to the show notes, you'll see a place to sign up for our insider newsletter where we send exclusive content including a free audio that I made on my top 10 tips for making and keeping great friends. This audio is only available for those who subscribe, and I know this will really help you, so please be sure to have your parents join the newsletter to get it. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Eva Cartman reminding you that you have limited potential. Your dreams are not optional. You need to make them essential. So take massive action to turn those big dreams into reality. Live with passion the way life is meant to be. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!